Um, we're going to give a little demonstration on how this works. Um, it's set up to go. We have to um, kind of be done flying by sunset, which is about 6:44. Yeah. I'm not earlier. Yeah. So um, it's going to give you a little demonstration. So that's our drone. We have six of these drones. Um, it's a, a Mavic Pro, Mavic Pro. Um, this is the controller. We use our phones for the screen to plug in. It takes just a couple minutes to get it set up. Um, I've already, just for time's sake, I've already calibrated it, which is going through a couple of steps to make sure everything is set right, the compass is set right, so it's, it's good to go. Yeah. So I'm gonna ask you to not step back a little bit now. <laughs> <laughs> How um, far? Uh, 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 10 giant steps back. Yes. Trust the screen. No, keep it in sight. That's one of the rules. Right. And we'll, we'll talk about that in there. But you have to keep it within your visual line of sight. So I can't take it out okay. half a mile and hope I can see it with binoculars. you got to see it with, with your eyes. And then we can go up. introduce myself. My name is Jeff Knox. I'm with the Daily Herald. I'm director of visuals, um, which means I oversee photo and video. Um, we got in the flying drones uh, about three years ago. And I'm going to show you. I've got a question for you to start with. So I'd like to get a lot of question and answer going, not just me talking. But if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand and ask it at any time. Um, would love to field your questions. So what's your understanding of drones these days and how they're used? Anybody? Right? Yep, um, farming. A buddy of mine's a farmer out west in Maple Park and he uses drones a lot. They can see um, wet spots, dry spots, places that aren't growing, places where the um, chemicals they put on aren't, are, are, aren't working, so yeah. Deliveries, Amazon, you know, you'll start getting things delivered to your house with a drone. Um, yeah, a lot of inspections are done now. ComEd used to use helicopters to inspect their power lines. And now, I mean, they still do for some, but now they're using drones so they can get up close. Um, it's just a cost, cost savings for them. So, yeah, so multiple uses for drones. But, well, we, we use them for a news gathering tool. Um, like I told somebody outside, it's a kind of a flying wide-angle lens. So and it allows us to get to places we couldn't normally get to. Um, but I'm going to take you through, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but take you through the different types of drone pilots and what we had to do to start our drone program. So there's really two types of drone pilots. There's people who fly commercially and people who are hobbyists or recreational users. Um, so we're commercial. Um, Commercial for business. Anything you're making money at is your commercial. Um, recreational, strictly for fun. So what we had to do, um, first thing we had to do to fly drones legally 
for commercial use was to get a license, and it's called a Part 107 license. Um, it's 60 questions, and when we started, we have six pilots at the Daily Herald, six certified drone pilots. When we started, we had no idea what we were getting into. The, the questions they asked about airspace, and we had to know a lot about weather and rain and fog and what can cause icing, um, it was a little overwhelming. But we all studied it. We took a, a course online and th different avenues, and we were able to, um, we all passed the test. It's 60 questions at an FAA facility. You have to get 70% correct. We all passed. So that's good. We're all safe. Um, so what, one thing we had to do, but the, the 107 test, you have to know about the different types of airspace, restricted airspace, airspace that's okay to fly in. Where we are now is restricted airspace. We ha I have to have a waiver or authorization from the FAA to fly here. And I got that. We can get them over our phones. So I got that a couple days ago, anticipating that we were going to be flying here. Um, we have to know how to read a sectional chart. We have to know what to do when things go wrong. Um, so it's, it's a lot of information. Here's an example of one of the questions. Um, how may a remote pilot in command, that's the person with the license, operating the, operate an unmanned aircraft in Class C airspace? And Class C airspace is Midway Airport, a, a large but not more of a, not an O'Hara-sized airport. So the answers are we, we must have um, prior authorization from air traffic control. And there's and we had to learn how to we had to learn how to read all of these maps. So what type of airspace is the Ridgeland Airport in? And the Ridgeland Airport is right here. Right there. So we had to know that those magenta lines with the hash marks are a military operation area. And then we have to know, once we know that, we have to know that the answer to that question is we have to, we have to fly with um, caution. We have to, just have to be extra careful there. There's restricted areas where we have, to, we have to make a phone call to fly, find out if anybody is flying there. The military operations are happening there. So these are the types of things, types of questions that are on that test. So we have to register our drones with the FAA. Um, I will show you, I'll bring the drone back out later and show you after we're done here. But we have to have an FAA license number on the side, just like you'd have a tail number on an airplane. Same thing, it has to be visible on the drone. We have to retake our test every two years. So we just, our whole group just finished retesting. And the, the, the retest is 40 questions. And it just goes over the same types of things. It's just not, it's just a refresher course for us. Oops. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. Yeah. So feel free, if you have, if you have questions, yeah, please. You you said we're in you restricted airspace here. Is that because of Pawaki or O'Hare? O'Hare. Okay. And then you had to get permission. You did that a couple of days ago. Right. If there's a breaking news story and you want to, you know, you need to get there. How long does it take you to get permission to go? Um, up? thirty seconds. It used to take. This is a relatively new development. If we wanted to get an, a waiver or an authorization to fly in restricted airspace, it could take three or four months. We had to fill out a form online send it to the FAA. You know, it's bureaucracy. <laughs> it takes a long time. And then if there was a problem with it, you'd find out three months later that it was denied, and you'd have to. And we had those. And we had, they were good for six months at a time. But now we have an app, and we can. The FAA changed all that with the with so many drones coming into our area now. So many, they were overwhelmed with requests for waivers, not just to fly in restricted airspace, but to fly at night, to, you know, to fly over people, to fly all kinds of things. So the airspace ones were what they're really bogged down with. And so it's called LANCE. It's, uh, I forget what LANCE stands for, but it's online, on our app. We say where we're going to fly, how long we're going to fly, and it'll, you send it in, 
and it sends you back a text in less than 30 seconds saying you're good to go or you're denied. So that's been very helpful for what we do. The incident, the incident last week with the um, Woodfield Mall, did you have drones over there and would you be allowed to use a drone to report? Yes, um, we didn't take a drone up over there. Um, just from a time standpoint, we didn't have we didn't have enough time to get it up, and we couldn't. There wasn't a lot to see from up in the air because um, it it was it started and finished pretty quickly. Um, so no, we didn't. We we thought about it and we checked. Oftentimes, there's something called the temporary flight restrictions, and over if if there's a danger of you know a lot of medical helicopters coming in or out there'd be a temporary flight restriction. We'd have to look on one of the apps we use to find that. If that's the case, we can't fly. If we did, we would be arrested because we don't want to put anybody in danger. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about TFRs in a few minutes. Uh, you mentioned that you took uh, a course to get certified and things like that. Yes. Did, did you all take the same online course? Yes. What was that course? Uh, Remote Pilot 101. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, it's, that course has a, there's a fee to it. You pay it once and it's good forever. Uh, there's other courses that are free. There's, you can, you can do a study course on YouTube if you want. There's all kinds, of, there are all kinds of them now. Does the app apply in any state? Yes, it finds you, it just locates you by GPS. So if, if I want to fly in Montana and I open it up, it's going to pinpoint right where I am. I'm curious about the um, police using the drones for searching for heat. Isn't, um, hasn't that been ruled as an illegal search of people's houses? Has it's, that raised it, privacy it, concerns? From a police standpoint, uh, I don't know that I can speak for the police, but usually when they're using them like for heat, like yeah. for heat signature, it's usually if somebody is lost in a cornfield or, you know, they found people who are maybe have wandered off from home they're staying at, maybe a, um, a child might be in a cornfield or in the woods somewhere, so they'll look for them that way. But I don't think they're using them to, you know, go over your house and look for that type of thing. I live in Schaumburg, mm -hmm. and uh, how far from Schaumburg Airport can I fly my drone? Oddly enough, Schaumburg Airport is not in, in restricted airspace. <laughs> So That's That's what good. we do in, in, when we want to fly near Schaumburg Airport, we call the airport and we say, hey, we're going to fly. We're going to be flying near there. Is there anything we should know? Um, but yeah, there's, there's no, um, for, for drone use anyway, there's no, well, there's no restrictions. Good. But it, it, it's prudent to check with them because there's a lot of traffic in and out of Schaumburg Airport. That used to be the rule for hobbyists. You, could, you had to notify, if you were a hobbyist, you had to notify, if you were in five miles of an airport, you had to notify them. Fines are coming in pretty low. Yeah, and it wasn't seek permission from them. They just say, hey, I'm flying. And that was, I, I never really liked that rule. That didn't make much sense. So now they made a change, and as of, I think, May of this year, even a hobbyist has to get authorization to fly in restricted airspace. It's restricted. It's restricted. Like, like flying here. This is restricted. It is not. I know. <coughs> it, 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 yeah. Well, it could. Be, could. Yeah, I, I don't know how many people are flying drones near there, but, you know, if we want to fly near the Chicago Executive, Powaukee, um, DuPage Airport, Aurora Airport, those are all in restricted airspace. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, we accept those. Um, you know, we don't want to fly where we're not supposed to fly. Right. 
Right. Right. Um, we, we usually just end up calling Schaumburg, and they're usually fine with it. If we want to fly there, they'll come. They'll tell us. They'll come out with us. They're they're very good about it. I think they like it when people call them and ask, rather than. I mean, last year, a year or so ago, somebody landed a drone on the runway at, at Chicago Executive. I mean, it was a, I don't know, you know, hundred dollar drone, with no control over it. But if that hit a plane, you know, it hit the engine, probably not gonna do much damage, but just hits the plane. But if it gets in an engine, it's got trouble. So um, we'll get back to the hobbyists. So the hobbyists don't have to have a license like we do. They still have to register their drone with the FAA. Um, they don't have to take a knowledge test like, like we had to take to get a license, but that's coming for hobbyists. And they have to follow the same, like we were just talking about, they have to fly the same, follow the same rules we do as far as flying in restricted airspace and a, and a bunch of other rules that I'm gonna hit here in a minute. So here's the rules, here, these are the main rules we all have to follow. The maximum altitude we can fly is 400 feet above ground level. And that can be exceeded if you're, if I'm taking pictures of uh, a radio, let's say a cell tower that's 100 feet tall, I can fly over that so I could fly. You can fly, you can go above 400 feet if you're shooting a, an object that's up in the air like that. Um, but right here, we can only sh I can only fly 200 feet because of the restrictions we have. And I'm going to show you that in a second here. So here's what I want to show you, though. We rarely fly at 400 feet. Most of our work is done at probably 50 feet to maybe 200 feet. 400 feet is pretty high. We can barely see. You saw the drone. It's small. When it gets up to 400 feet in the air on maybe a slightly cloudy day, it's hard to see. So we rarely fly that high. It gets to look almost like a Google map at that point. So this is, four, this is 400 feet. It's just an example of 300, 200, 150. So it gives you kind of an idea of, of where we are. With, so like I said, most of our work is done maybe 50 feet to, I don't know, 200. I was shooting a picture here earlier tonight before everybody got here around 5 o'clock of this building, and I was probably at about, probably right at 50 feet, maybe 45, 50 feet, so not very high. So another big rule, don't fly over people, ever. You can get a waiver, you can try to get a waiver for that from the FAA just like you can for restricted airspace. I think the FAA has given maybe four waivers to fly over people. Um, I think they're to CNN and they're drones that are tethered. So they're like, actually, you're physically hooked to like a rope of some sort of string or something. So they're very strict about that. But flying over people, so here's an example. We're not over people, we were close to people. So we don't go over people, but you can be adjacent to them. And the lens, you know, you can tilt it, you know, the way you want it to go. So you can get, this was a, um, a student protest in Barrington um, a year or so ago. So we figured a good way to do that is from the ground, showing them marching down the streets, but also from the air to show the, to show the crowd. No flying at night. Um, so my, my waiver to fly tonight was good till sunset, which was 645. Um, you can apply to fly at night, but you have to have lights on your drone. And you, you just like trying to apply to fly in restricted airspace, you have to apply to the FAA. And the, this, these are the safety precautions I'm taking. These are what I'm going to do if things go wrong. These are the kind of type of lights I have. So it's pretty strict to fly at night. And you'll see all kinds of videos on YouTube around the 4th of July of people flying right into fireworks. And that's just crazy dangerous. One, you could lose your drone. Two, it could get hit by fireworks and crash on somebody. It's just not safe. So we, we don't do that. Um, we, all, we have to keep the drone within our line of sight, visual line of sight, it's called. So if we're going to fly, here's an example. If we're taking pictures of somebody painting a water tower a couple years ago, we have to be able to see the drone with our naked eye. We can't, you know, we can't use binoculars to keep an eye on it for the whole time, always with the eyes. So and we take, we'll take a visual observer out with us too. 
Um, that's always a great idea. We do it. We don't do it all the time. It's not required. But if we're going to be in an area where it's kind of tight where we're flying or there's a lot of traffic or things that could distract us, we'll take a visual observer with us. And that's just somebody that has eyes that can watch the drone and say, hey, you're getting too close to that tree or you're getting too close to those power lines. Um, or if it starts to drift, if it's too windy, you know, they'll say, hey, you got to bring it back. So we, we're always very safe with that. Um, and no flying in restricted airspace unless you have authorization. So what's, what's restricted airspace? So these are the maps we had to learn. We had no clue what these maps meant when we first started. So we are right, that's O'Hare Airport. We are right about here, right about there. And so this is saying we can't fly some of these numbers, well, we're right there, actually. So when it says surface to 100, that's 10,000 feet. Surface to 10,000 feet, we cannot fly unless we have an authorization. When you get a little further out, Woodfield Airport, you're restricted from flying above 1,900 feet. So we can only go to 400 feet. So we're fine to fly here because the restrictions don't start until 1,900 feet. And as you get further out from the airports, the ceiling gets higher. This is Aurora Airport, same thing. DuPage Airport, when you've got those little brackets around that number, surface to 3,300 feet, we cannot fly. So if we're flying, if we want to take pictures along the Fox River in Geneva or St. Charles, we have to have authorization. That's Midway Airport. There's different types of airspace. The solid blue line is Class D airspace, and that's, or, I'm sorry, Class B airspace. Those are the big airports, O'Hare, Atlanta, big cities. Um, Magenta, that's a, sm a slightly smaller airport, so that's Midway Airport. And you get to these types of um, Aurora, DuPage, smaller airports. But yet, no restrictions around Schaumburg Airport's right, right over in there, right there. It's okay to fly. So yeah, you're right, but it seems, seems kind of crazy not to have something. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. From the ground to 3,300 feet in the air, we can't fly oh, at, all. at all without authorization. But where it says, where it says you can't fly at 1,900 feet, that's where the restrictions start from the ground to 1900, it's okay because you're further away. We can only fly at 400 feet max, so we're fine to fly there. No, <clears throat> no uh, Friday night uh, football games or boomer ball games, any of that type of thing? Not at night. Nope, not unless we have a waiver. I was at a football game a couple weeks ago and somebody was flying a dr drone over the marching band at halftime at night. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> So, and this is another type of map we utilize. It's called a facility map. And it's just a big grid of numbers, it looks like, over where we are. So, these, once you get a waiver to fly, these are the maximum altitudes you can fly. So, we have to know all of this. So, this is O'Hare. So, we're not going to get, that's zero. We can't fly there. They're not going to give you. We were, we're up in this area. So, with our waiver, we can go up 200 feet in the air. No more than that. The FAA says that's the safest, that's a safe altitude for us to fly. We're not going to come in contact or endanger any flights that are coming out. So the further you get away from the airports, the higher the numbers get up to 400 feet, and then they, the grid just disappears when you're in safe airspace. So we talked about, I mentioned outside, what we used to have to do when we wanted to get an aerial photo. That's Arlington Park that was shot from a helicopter. If we want to get a helicopter today, it's, I haven't priced them out lately, but they're at least 500 bucks an hour. A lot of money. 
Same thing, tornado damage. This was shot from a plane, actually I shot this, from an airplane in 1990. Cheaper than a helicopter, but still expensive. And now we can take a drone and we can go to Six Flags and we can shoot till our heart's content. Um, Steve Lundy, one of our photographers um, and drone pilots right here, shot that picture. So Steve's an expert drone pilot. So in the other place that comes in handy is we have some breaking news. Um, this was up in Lake County. You probably heard this when the, the five kids came out and they were trying to steal, steal the man's car and he came out and it had a bad ending. Somebody was shot and killed, but he lived way down a long driveway and we couldn't really see anything. But with a drone, we can go up and we can get a better perspective, we can get a better perspective on what's happening. We can show the area, we can show how far that driveway was, we can show where the house was, um, where they were and how remote it was. So this is, I want to show you a couple of examples of how we've used this in print. We did something with um, veterans decorating um, uh, gravestones at a cemetery in Elgin for Memorial Day. This was um, flooding uh, up in Lake County a year or so ago. And then to tell a story about growth, that was about um, a, for a story on the census and how this certain area was growing, so we were able to take the drone up and show new construction. Uh, we all, we're also online, we live stream, so we can set the drone up to live stream. So this was the protest we talked about earlier at Barrington. Um, we can put it on Facebook, we can live stream, which is pretty, we, we don't, haven't done it a lot, but when we do, it, it gets great reception. Uh, we live stream from the floods. And one other thing we do, as far as being good neighbors and responsible in our community, we've met, I've met personally with probably 30 to 40 police departments in our area over the last couple of years, just to introduce myself, introduce our drone program, and talk to them about their concerns. Uh, we will we'll talk, I'll show them how the drone works. A lot of them know now. Um, I'll give a demonstration on how the drone works, kind of like we did tonight. Um, we'll go back in and sit down and, and they'll ask me questions about, will you fly a drone if it's gonna endanger the police? And my answer is no. <laughs> Will you live stream if it's gonna, if there's a hostage situation and your live streaming is gonna endanger the police, will you, will you use it? No, we won't. So generally what we'll do if we come onto a news scene where the police are, we'll check in with them. Not necessarily seek permission, but we'll check in, say, hey, we're gonna take our drone up. Is there anything we should know? And no, go ahead. Or two, no, it's not good. They're, you know, if you're gonna, it could distract from different things. So we'll, we'll listen to them. We're gonna trust that they're not telling us one thing just to not have coverage. Um, so they've been very receptive with that. And often when we go into community, we will call, the, call them ahead of time and say, hey, we're coming out. If you get, you know, we're gonna be shooting some real estate pictures or we're gonna be shooting this area. It's kind of near a school. So I just want you to know in case somebody calls. If we're near an elementary school, we'll call the school. Say, hey, we're gonna be in the area. If you see a drone, this is what we're doing because drones near elementary schools freak people out <laughs> a lot. And almost all the time it's unfounded. There was a school, I can't remember the location. They saw, you know, just an elementary school in a nice neighborhood. They saw a drone in the air and they had a soft lockdown because they thought it was spying on the kids. The drone's 200 feet in the air and it was a realtor doing something blocks away. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of bad actors out there doing bad things with drones and it gives legit people problems. So we're very careful about if we're flying near a school to contact the school so they don't, because we don't want them calling the police and, waste, and wasting their time. So there's a lot of guidelines we follow. I gave one of the handouts you have is from, um, it's called the Pointer Institute. It's a um, 
I'm a journalism think tank, and they worked with the National Press Photographers, and they've come up with ethical and safety guidelines. The, but the one thing we do, first rule ever, is safety. So we, safety is our number one rule. If we can't fly safely, we won't fly. If it's too windy, we won't fly. If there's too much interference from power lines, we won't fly. We've got apps that tell us if, the GP, if we have, don't have enough GPS satellites. If that's the case, we won't fly. Um, these are an example of some of the things we use. One of them is called UVA forecast. And it'll, it says, when I took this screenshot, it says it wasn't good to fly. And that's because the wind gusts were 22 miles an hour. That's a little too windy to be flying a drone. And that's 22 on the ground. So that's probably gusting to 25, 30 miles an hour in the air. And if this drone gets up in 30 mile an hour winds, it just will go away. <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll start to drift. I had it up once and it was windier than I thought. And it was just, I want it there and it's moving this way. I'm trying to bring it back and it's moving this way. So I brought it down. It just wasn't, it was too windy to fly. So everything else, you know, it'll talk about the number of satellites that you have, the wind is our main concern, the weather, cloud cover, all, all looks good, but the wind it, on that particular day, it was too windy to fly. And the example on the left is an app we use, it's called AirMap, and it'll pinpoint where we are, and then it'll tell you, hey, you're in controlled airspace, you need to have authorization to fly at or below 200 feet. And that's, this was an air map screenshot for, the, for this area. So once we do that, there's a couple of steps you go through and you get the authorization and you're, you're good to fly and you're, you're legal to fly. On that same map, you'll see in this example on the left, there is a orange circle in the upper right, right by that word Chicago. Right there. Right there. So that's a temporary flight restriction. And that one happens to be over um, guaranteed rate field. Sox had a home game. So you cannot fly a drone over professional sports, outdoor professional sports stadium. So there'll always be a TFR over a Sox game or a Cubs game or Bears game. And um, also NCAA games, so football games where the crowd I believe is over 30,000 people, there'll be a TFR. You cannot fly there. You'll be arrested. If they see a drone flying, if they find you, you'll be arrested because it's not safe. Um, and those apply to, I think, an hour before the game to about an hour after the game. And you'll see those also when any sort of VIPs are in town, if the president comes to town, vice president, they'll be over O'Hare Airport or Midway or wherever, wherever they happen to be. So we take those very, a bunch of oil tankers train cars derailed, and we were going to go down there and we checked our app. Sure enough, big orange circle over it because they had um, rescue, like rescue helicopters coming in and different types of things, so our drones were going to get in the way. That's the other thing, too. We talked, I've talked with police and fire departments, but I've also talked with the Flight for Life folks, and they hate drones <laughs> because they won't come in if they see a drone in the area. They, they won't endanger their pilots. So if you're flying a drone and there's a flight for life coming in, they won't come in. So you potentially are harming somebody else if they can't come in safely. Um, they take it very seriously. Um, so if we know there's a flight coming in, that's why we talk to the police. They'll say there's a flight for life coming in. So we're not flying. Just not, we wouldn't risk that. So I think a lot of people have privacy concerns where it comes to drones. So what we, our basic guidelines are if we can't shoot it on the ground, ethically speaking, we are not gonna shoot it from the air. So one of the questions the police have, if we come across an accident scene, you know, car accident, sometimes they're pretty nasty. Sometimes there's a body laying in the road, perhaps. Will we shoot that from the air? No, because we wouldn't shoot that from the ground. Um, are we gonna peer over somebody's fence? No, if we can't shoot it from the ground, we're not gonna shoot it from the air, ethically speaking. Um, legally speaking, could we? 
Probably. The F I mean, nobody owns their airspace. The FAA owns the airspace from the top of the grass all the way up. So you don't own the airspace in your backyard. You don't own the airspace around your car. Um, so and that, that gets it gets pretty dicey because people can people can fly wherever they where they want to fly, but we won't do that. We won't hover over somebody's yard. We're not gonna, you know, we would never peer in somebody's window. That's the question I get from the police. You know, are do you get how close do you get to houses? And that's why we call the police because we're not the ones doing that. And if people see that happening, they should call the police. Um, but this it's it's a wide angle lens. It's not gonna that you heard the drone. It's not gonna sneak up on you. It's kind of loud. Um, if I wanted to look through a window, I'd have to get that close to the window. <laughs> so it's, it's not going to happen with us. Um, and we respect, I, one of my points up there is we respect the moment. If it's, you know, there's been a lot of memorial services lately for different things. People have gone missing. Police officers have been killed. There's a quiet moment. It's, maybe it's a beautiful moment. But if it's quiet, we're not going to hover a drone over, over it and, and distract people from what they're there for. Um, we don't encourage other people to fly illegally. So if somebody comes to us with this great drone footage and they flew illegally to get it, we won't use it. We don't want to encourage that type of behavior. Now, if there, there's always exceptions to things. If somebody was flying from a hobbyist perspective, flying and then they caught something and it, you know, if they caught something that they probably shouldn't have, but they weren't flying for that reason, it's kind of hard to explain, but we might consider that, but we don't, in general, if they're flying illegally, if they went out to fly illegally in restricted airspace or something like that, and they tried to sell it to us, we wouldn't use it. Um, so we don't encourage other people to. And lastly, our drone pilot has the final say. If we're out there, if we, if we want a picture and we really want it bad, our managing editor who's standing right back there is never going to pressure us to do it. Are you sure? I'm positive. Because <laughs> um, we're the ones that are out there. We're the ones that are at risk. We have an insurance policy, good for a million bucks if something happens. And we don't want to ever have to use that. And if, it, if, we're, if we feel it's unsafe to fly, if it's too close to power lines, if it's too windy, if it's saying you don't have enough satellites to fly safely, any number of things, we won't. And if, you know, I've had one of our pilots call me in the office and say, I can probably go up. I'm like, it's up to you. If you think it's too windy, don't go. And it's like, all right, I'm not gonna go. I'm like, that's fine. We'll do it another day. Or we'll just shoot it from the ground. We will not risk crashing our drone is the least of our concerns. Hurting somebody is right at the top. We don't wanna have it crash, fall, drift off into somebody's car, into somebody's house, into somebody walking on the street. Just don't. So I've kind of gone through this fairly quickly. Um, so I'm hoping you have some questions. And I can, I can do some show and tell up here. I'll get the drone back out. You can look at it also. Yeah. Somebody who doesn't register their drone? They don't, not unless something happens. So it's, it's hard to manage because the drone, the number of drones and people using drones has just exploded. They can barely keep up with it. If, you, if, a, if a person ever saw a drone flying over people or at night, who would you report that to? You could call your local police department and tell them. You, there's a local FAA office you can contact. There's a, there's, I contact them once in a while just with different questions I have. Odds are, though, you're not going to catch them. I mean, you can, I, it's good to report it, but by the time you report it and they come out, it's probably gone. Airspace in your backyard. You don't own the airspace around your car. Um, so, and that, that gets, it gets pretty dicey because people can, People can fly wherever they, where they want to fly, but we won't do that. We won't hover over somebody's yard. We're not going to, you know, 
we would never peer in somebody's window. That's the question I get from the police, you know. Are, do you get, how close do you get to houses? And that's why we call the police, because we're not the ones doing that. And if people see that happening, they should call the police. Um, but this, it's, it's a wide-angle lens. It's not gonna, that, you heard the drone. It's not going to sneak up on you. It's kind of loud. Um, if I wanted to look through a window, I'd have to get that close to the window. <laughs> so it's, it's not going to happen with us. Um, and we respect, one of my points up there is we respect the moment. If it's, you know, there's been a lot of memorial services lately for different things. People have gone missing, police officers have been killed. If there's a quiet moment, it's, maybe it's a beautiful moment, but if it's quiet, we're not going to hover a drone over, over it and, and distract people from what they're there for. Um, we don't encourage other people to fly illegally. So if somebody comes to us with this great drone footage, and they flew illegally to get it, we won't use it. We don't want to encourage that type of behavior. Now, if there, there's always exceptions to things. If somebody was flying from a hobbyist perspective, flying and then they caught something, and it, you know, if they caught something that they probably shouldn't have, but they weren't flying for that reason, it's kind of hard to explain, but. We might consider that, but we don't, in general, if they're flying illegally, if they went out to fly illegally in restricted airspace or something like that, and they tried to sell it to us, we wouldn't use it. Um, so we don't encourage other people to. And lastly, our drone pilot has the final say. If we're out there, if we, if we want a picture and we really want it bad, our managing editor who's standing right back there is never going to pressure us to do it. Are you sure? I'm positive. Because um, we're the ones that are out there. We're the ones that are at risk. We have an insurance policy, good for a million bucks if something happens. And we don't want to ever have to use that. And if, it, if, we're, if we feel it's unsafe to fly, if it's too close to power lines, if it's too windy, if it's saying you don't have enough satellites to fly safely, any number of things, we won't. And if, you know, I've had one of our pilots call me in the office and say, I can probably go up. I'm like, it's up to you. If you think it's too windy, don't go. And it's like, all right, I'm not going to go. Like, that's fine. We'll do it another day. Or we'll just shoot it from the ground. We will not risk crashing our drone is the least of our concerns. Hurting somebody is right at the top. We don't want to have it crash, fall, drift off into somebody's car, into somebody's house, into somebody walking on the street. We just don't. So. I've kind of gone through this fairly quickly. Um, so I'm hoping you have some questions. And I can, I can do some show and tell up here. I'll get the drone back out. You can look at it also. Yeah. Somebody who doesn't register their drone? They don't. Not unless something happens. So it's, it's hard to manage because the drone the number of drones and people using drones has just exploded. They can barely keep up with it. If, you, if, a, if a person ever saw a drone flying over people or at night, who would you report that to? You could call your local police department and tell them. You, there's a local FAA office you can contact. There's a, there's, I contact them once in a while just with different questions I have. Odds are, though, you're not going to catch them. I mean, you can, I, it's good to report it, but by the time you report it and they come out, it's probably gone. But you can, I mean, it's, it's worth reporting, because if they've done it once, they'll probably do it again. Hey, Jeff. Maybe you should go through the, uh, the full slideshow video thing at the beginning and explain what that was all about. Yeah. Well, let me run through that. Let me get back to that. And then I'll finish off with, um, we've got a couple of videos here that we've done. Let me just run through this real quick and I'll pull that up. So this was a dragon boat race in this plains. And we, we'll, this will help us, we'll use drone footage, we'll use stuff we shoot from the ground. Um, rarely is something strictly drones. We'll shoot it in a number of ways.
our team is paddling for MB. Um, we're out of DeKalb, and our strategy today is to win, but staying patient in the water and working as a team and one stroke at a time. This is, our, this is our drum. Three years ago, this was something we never would have had a chance to do, a chance to shoot this way. This is kind of a fun one. This is, you've seen the trolls in, at the Arboretum in Lyle. Um, this is a fun one to shoot. The project is called uh, uh, the Troll Hunt, and it is uh, seven art pieces here in the Morton Arboretum that will open the 22nd of uh, June. And then, um, it's a part of a fairy tale that I'm uh, telling around the world in uh, different, uh, through these different uh, sculptures. And all the trolls are made like 98% of uh, recycled wood and uh, trash wood that we found around locally here. I think that uh, it's important for people to come outside their cars and to actually go into nature and experience how beautiful this uh, operatum and this forest is. Show you, let me show you this slideshow at the beginning. We had it kind of running on a loop while people were coming in. This is just an example of some of the work our staff has done. So you just saw this. This is the trolls at the Arboretum. This is just, you know, some a different way to look at the autumn colors. We talked about that one at um, Bluff City Cemetery. This is the Dragon Boat Races. This was a home that exploded in Marengo a couple years ago. Um, this is up in Lake County, it's a pyramid house of all things. When they said a pyramid house is on fire, I'm like, what? Um, and so the drone really gave us a great perspective on how to, how to look at that. That's the Marengo house. Um, just bad, but it gives you a different perspective. This is the flooding in Lake County. You know, this is areas we could never get to on the ground. This is a, a barn fire in Winfield. Um, another house explosion, they had a little rash of those a couple years ago. A story we did on the Fox River and dams they were going to remove. This is a story for a dangerous intersection in Schaumburg. More from the trolls. Um, Arlington Racetrack and some of the businesses around there. And just pretty scenic pictures in different seasons. Downtown St. Charles. This 
It's a, kind of a different shot of a carnival. The pyramid house again the next day. That's when the fire was happening. This is a uh, procession for a funeral for a police officer. Just another winter scene in, along the Fox River. It was not too long ago in Waukegan, a business exploded. Arlington Park. Uh, we did a story on when it was really wet and they couldn't get the crops in and then it got really dry. So it was kind of weird. And then um, road construction of all things. It's just kind of a neat picture of something we couldn't get to show how long that road construction is if we were just on the ground. So we use, it, we use the drone for a variety of assignments from breaking news to just scenic pictures to just a different way to explain explain what's happening with a certain story. Um, growth in a subdivision, road construction, um, the building a new round, one of those pictures of roundabout and this planes that they were gonna rebuild. So we wanted to show it from the air, like show what it really looks like. So it, it's been a great tool for that. Um, but it's a tool we have to be very responsible with. It's, it is a flying camera, so we're very safe with it. We follow the rules to the letter. We don't waver from them at all. If, if we can't do it, we won't do it. It's not worth, at the very least, damaging our drone and at worst case, hurting somebody. So we just, we just won't. So I am open for questions. I'm happy to show the drone, get it back out, and you guys can hold it. You're not going to break it. Um, if you want to see what it, how light it is or if you have any questions about it. Have any, any of your drones ever crashed? No, not really. <laughs> um, not really. <laughs> We had one that we were landing it, and it kind of lands like front legs first and then back, and the front ones came down and a gust of wind came. We were kind of between a couple buildings in our parking lot at our former office, and the gust came at just the right time, and it picked it up, and it like spun it around. So we had to send it in for repair. It had a little lens damage. Nothing too major, though. We haven't crashed, we haven't crashed a drone into anything, though. Um, we just use the Mavics right now. We find that for our purposes, it's perfect. We have, this is the, the one I have is the first generation, and then the other five we have are the, Mav, the next one, the Mavic Pro Platinum. And now they have even better ones with the Hasselblad lenses on them, and those are pretty nice. But we like this over, say, the Phantoms. They're just bulky. The Inspires are too expensive for what we do. I mean, if we were doing a lot of high-end work where we had to have these huge files or we were inspecting power lines or something like that where we couldn't get close. We needed the ability to have a zoom lens and get close. We would use those, but for our purposes, these are perfect. Yes, sir. Is there any way that you can lose control of the drone? Yes. Mm. You can lose control of the drone. Two. Um, it, it has happened. We did lose control of one, and it came back. So it's not uncommon for that to happen. It, it doesn't happen very often. You can shut the controller off, turn it back on, try to regain control. Um, sometimes you lose your GPS signal, and then it'll just, then you're, then, you're the, then you're the one in control. There's no GPS holding it in, in place, and if it's windy, it's going to be rocking and rolling and moving around and hard to control. So we haven't, we've, we've lost control, we've regained control, so it didn't just disappear on us. But that does happen, that can happen if you're not careful. So one of the things we look at, um, on one of the slides I had, it was called a KP index. And I don't know the ins and outs of it, but if that number goes over five, it means you have a really good chance of losing your GPS control. Yeah? What happens if you lose any control altogether? Is there something in the drone that'll tell us to land? So if it just, if we lose control of it and it just takes off, It'll, when it gets to 10% battery power, it'll try to return to home if it, if it can. Otherwise, it'll land. If we 
are, if we're flying it and it loses control and it looks like it's going to drift into a, a building or a large group of people or something, something bad, we can, we can shut it off. We can shut it off in midair and just make it drop if we have to. We haven't had to do that. If we shut it off in midair, it's just going to drop like a rock. But we can try to get it. We try to get it back if it's. It's only happened a few times for us where we've lost the GPS signal and it starts to drift, but we've gotten it back by shutting the controller off, turning it back on. There's a couple of different steps you can do. Um, so we've, we haven't had an issue where it's drifted and we've lost control of it. it it's super scary, though, when it happens. <laughs> yes? Do you insure the machine itself? Uh, the machine itself is not insured. But it is, we are insured for damage. So if, if, it's, if, we, if for some reason it crashes into the, a house, our insurance covers that. To repair, to repair our drone, no. We have um, a million dollar liability policy. Yes? Are you programmed or programmed rather than manually operated? Yeah, you can. You can do that. So. It does, it does return to home automatically if something happens. Um, if it starts to run low on battery, but you can, you can control. You could, you could set up points and it can do patterns. Like it'll do some things we, we don't really do this much, but there's, you know, engineering companies, construction companies will use drones to map things. So that it'll go back and forth and it'll map a certain area. And you can, you can pre program it to do that. Are there uh, drones that uh, can pick up sound as well as pictures? Yes, ours don't, but there are drones that can do that. Ours does not record sound. Yes. For improvements. So, so if you're a hobbyist, buy a drone now or wait. If you want a drone, I'd get a drone. It's gonna, it's technology. It's gonna, it's like buying an iPhone. It's gonna, there's gonna be a new one next year. Yeah. New one at next, you know, two years later, there's gonna be another one. They'll, they'll always be coming out with better, smaller, faster. Um, so if you want one, I would get one. I'm I would, I wouldn't skimp though. I wouldn't get a, I wouldn't get a drone that's under a hundred dollars. <laughs> uh, you know, these are pretty, they're, they're a little on the expensive side, and I haven't researched a lot of other ones, but. They're out there, and you don't have to spend a ton of money, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go too cheap either. I'm curious about the experience of driving one of these things. You told me outside that you watch it in the air and manipulate it. I thought you watched the screen through the camera. And you, you, well, you can do both. Um, if I have a visual observer with me and he's watching the drone, then I'll, I'll just watch the screen. I'll watch the screen for the most part, but it's, you know, for, for where we had it tonight, it wasn't too far out. I yeah. can keep an eye on it and I can look at the screen for what I want to take a picture of, but then I can see, oh, I'm too far left or right. So I'm probably going to look back at the drone when I'm controlling it rather than just looking at my screen because I want to be able to see if I'm just looking at my screen, it's kind of hard to tell if it's starting to drift for whatever reason, or if I'm getting too close to something, the only way I'm going to see that is if I'm, I'm looking, looking at Looking at the drone. Right. So, it, you know, best case scenario is always have a visual observer with you. That's a recommendation. It's not a requirement. So if we're flying way out in the open, the forest preserve or something where there's a lot of open land, you know, we probably won't have one. If we're flying in more of a congested area, you, the one picture we had up there of the roundabout in Displains, um, one of our drone pilots was out there, and I was his visual observer. I would, or the... Better, even better example is the, the great the cemetery where they were planting the flags. There were trees all around. So when our pilot Brian was flying that, he was back and he was going, he was trying to get a shot where he was reversing the drone. I'm like, okay, that's far enough. You're too close to the trees. So he'd stop and then we'd reposition. So it's, it's good to have a second set of eyes if you're in an area where you, you think you need one. I'm thinking of the shot where you're following the, um, the boats. And, right. You know, Presumably, you're on shore, mm -hmm. and this drone and those boats are heading out. So, I mean, you must be 
looking at the screen. I mean, well, both. We're looking at the screen, and then so we're confident that what we're seeing on the screen is good. So we're, we'll look at the drone and make sure it's following along where it right. needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, we don't have the best. Um, we do have a bright orange. Um, I didn't have it out tonight, but we have a bright orange landing pad that's pretty visible, and that comes in a case, and we'll usually hang that on something. Um, when we're flying, we're not generally like on the edge of a road. We're out of people's way, but we've, we've thought about getting those vests. It's a good idea, I think. Yes? Um, they're all staff photojournalists. Jeff and Steve are not young kids, no. <laughs> but we're younger than you. <laughs> Touche. Uh, no, like I said, when we started taking this test, a lot of guys hadn't taken a test in 25 years. Um, and it was just, it was kind of like going back to school, learning some of this stuff. So they're all, I'd say we're all middle-aged pilots. <laughs> with no aeronautical experience whatsoever. That's why it was hard, you know, to learn, to learn the maps. I'm not saying we know everything about it, but we, we know what we need to know for, you know, in order to look at the, the, um, the charts, the facility maps. We, we know what we need to know for drones. I'm not saying I could fly a Cessna <laughs> at all, um, but we can fly these drones, and we feel we can fly them safely. I'd say either way, really. It just depends on what we're, we're shooting. Um, I think, as with anything, you kind of need to know your subject, know what you're trying to get, have a plan before you go out. Like, you know, this is what I want to shoot. This is the type of picture I want to get. Um, start there, say, okay, can how can we do that safely? Okay, so we, we know what we want to get. We can fly safely, so we'll go up and, and we'll look on the screen and we'll see if that, see if that works. Yes? So besides the license, do you have to get like a, a certain number of hours practicing, much like a driver's license? No. Is that and that's, part of the licensing? No, and that's really interesting because you can get your license and not know one thing about flying a drone. Um, so we, we learned along the way. We practiced with the drone. We, we had the drone. We practiced with it before we had our license, which is legal. We were just learning how the thing works. We weren't using it for work or anything. And then once we got the license, then we were able to fly. We have one of our photographers, uh, Mark Welsh, he's been flying drones for years, way before we started doing it. And he's been itching to do it. And we just said, you can't. There's no way we can use that drone. I'd be perfect for this assignment, but there's no way we can use that because we're not licensed yet. Could you? Probably. Not get caught? Probably wouldn't ever get caught. But if something happened, you'd be in trouble. And we, we wouldn't take that risk. Yes, way in the back. How fast does your drone go? Pardon me? How fast does your drone go? Do you know, Steve? I think, it goes, I think it can go up to about 40 miles an hour. It can go fast. There's a mode on it called sport mode, and you can, it, can, it can move. But you have less control over it. So it's not a racing drone, <laughs> we'll put it that way. Um, but it, it can go pretty fast. We don't, really, we don't really go that fast. If we have to get from point A to point B, we're pretty, we're pretty conservative with how fast we fly. Um, when you were flying at the Morton Arboretum, did you need to obtain permission from them? And if we did. So how did you go about that? We just called the Arboretum and asked if we could fly. And they were cool about that? They were. We told um, them what we were doing. So like I, like I said, I mentioned earlier, they don't, the Arboretum does not own the airspace over the Arboretum. Exactly. But they can control if you take off or land at the Arboretum. So a lot of towns are trying to put restrictions on drones, saying you can't fly over parks, you can't fly over schools. Um, there was recently a, a case, as a town in California that had these crazy restrictive rules. And the National Press Photographers Association, I mentioned earlier, their attorney sent them a letter and threatened to sue them if they didn't look at, look at the rules. Um, because they don't own, so they're trying to, 
they're trying to supersede federal law That's why I with their that. own laws. And, and you, they can't do that. At, at this point, they can't do that. So they could certainly say, you can't take off from here and land here. That's perfectly within their rights. But if they say you just can't fly over mm. our park or our school or our church or, or whatever they want to say, they, they can't do that. Okay. And then I have a second question. Um, what apps do you most use for Part 107 work? Um, I know you mentioned a couple. Are there any other that you use a lot? So we use, um, the app we use to fly with is the DJI app, which is, that's the manufacturer of the drone. We use AirMap a lot. That'll tell us what kind of airspace we're in. And that's the app we use to get our um, authorizations. Um, UVA Forecast is another good one. That's the one that had all the little squares on it and said not safe to fly. Um, we use that one a lot. There's, there's Kitty Hawk is another one, um, similar to AirMap. Uh, so there's, there's so many out there now. I think we just we find a, find a few we like, and that's what we use. But that doesn't mean they're the only ones. There's a ton of them out there, just the ones we're comfortable with. Yes. Ooh, that'd be fun. Um, has anybody ever had a drone fly in the eye of a storm? Uh, no, not us. I probably could, but you'd probably lose your drone. I think it would, I mean, this, the, the thing's only two pounds. Come up afterwards and hold it. It's, it's light. Um, I'm, I'm sure it'd be phenomenal video, but it, at, at the cost of the drone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and who knows where it's going to land, and that's the other problem. I thought somebody else had a question. No. Nope. Yes. Um, is the camera rolling all the time while the drone is flying, or do you have a control that turns it off and on? Well, we have a control. We can either shoot video with it, or we can shoot still pictures with it. So tonight I had it just on still pictures. So every time I push the button, it would take a picture. If I, it just takes a second to flip it to video, and then the video would be running constantly until you had to land it or you're, you ran out of room on your memory card. So e either way, it just depends what you want to do. And if you're shooting video, you can also push the button and it'll, it'll take a still. Yes? They have drones that will get energy from the sun. So you don't have to have a battery take, it can fly longer. Solar drones, that's interesting. No, I, not that I know of. I, I doubt that's too far down the road, though. That's an interesting thought, though. Because so like, the, the downside, the drones, the, the batteries don't last that long. I mean, 25 minutes to full to empty, so it means you can fly maybe 20 minutes before it starts getting too close. To You don't want to run it down too far. You have to stop and then... Like, I was downstate last year shooting with it for two days, and I was constantly taking the battery out, putting it on, driving to the next place, had it charging in my, you know, the outlet in my car. So they, they do drain pretty fast. Question? One more time, I, I'm going to come over to you. Oh, I did, okay. She was wondering if it was rechargeable. Oh, yep, they're rechargeable. So, um, well, if there's no more questions, I'm happy to get the drone out, and you guys can come up and hang on to it and look at it. And um, I've got cards up here, business cards I'll give you if you'd like. If you have any drone photography ideas or any story ideas or photo ideas, please contact us. Um, some of our best ideas come from somebody picking up the phone and calling us. All right, thank you.